Thank you, Kyle and Jillian. Excellent presentation. And a shout out to Luke Treadwell and Shane Walsh from the United Kingdom who are joining us today. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, the Associate Director of Integrated Health and Athlete Performance for the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Um, and we cannot, we had, a, we had a question about Dave online. We cannot divulge any personal information, I'm joking. But uh, I'm gonna hand over to lead this Q&A to Dave Taylor from the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Unfortunately, um, we were having microphone issues, but the Q&A was going off through that one. And I think the quality of presentations really shows why you guys are in the positions you are. Uh, the first uh, summation of that is that uh, you all mentioned the importance of communication within your high performance team. How do you make sure that you're all on the same page when you have unique backgrounds and knowledge? What we'll do is I'd like to start it off with Trent. We'll roll to Carlos, then Dean, then Carl, and then Jillian, seeing as uh, these are summation of questions. Yes, I guess that means I'm up. Um, first of all, great question. And, you know, I go back to the quote of communication is, is not what's said, it's what is heard. And so for us, I think the, the simplest answer to that question is you talk to each other, you communicate. Um, you know, here in Detroit, we, we utilize a couple of phrases, uh, you know, shared consciousness is one of them. And so you would basically establish meetings or you establish a process where each person uh, who's involved with the return to play process uh, communicates with one another, whether that's a meeting, et cetera, to decide what the athlete is going to do that particular day, uh, both at a, a micro level, but then also discuss some of the macro level um, decisions. And then from there, you you know, each of us has empowered execution where uh, we execute that plan that we've discussed as a staff. And so a short answer is to, to communicate and using words that each stakeholder will understand. Um, uh, but then having that empowered execution to know that I can do my job because everybody's got my back and supporting what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, basically, um, great, uh, great question, Dave, and great answer, Trent. I feel like communication is key, as I mentioned in my presentation, and, and also um, having a team that communicates the same way, and it doesn't have to be like meetings. I feel like that communication, when small talks, just walking in the office, crossing by, hey, what do you think of this guy? So small talks like that, and then obviously communicating. There has to be one message to the coaching staff, so I feel like once you communicate that to the coaching staff, we all have to be uh, whole accountable. And I feel like if you have a good com uh, communication uh, style within your team and a culture, then um, everything is, is going to work out at the end. Um, yeah, it's similar to uh, Carlos and uh, Trent. In our environment, we're really lucky. We had um, Jim Cavallini came in as a director and has put together a uh, really, A, a big team, but a really good team of um, kind of egoless practitioners um, that spans the space of, you know, athletic training and uh, rehabilitation through to mental skills and nutrition. So we have people from very different backgrounds. And what we do is um, we have regular meetings. With those regular meetings, it's um, it's very open, it's very relaxed, people feel comfortable, and each of us get our moment to share our perspective coming from our unique uh, backgrounds. Um, and in that, my space obviously brings a lot of uh, what Trent talked about earlier into his presentation, objectivity. So my role is to um, basically try and bring information but in a way that can be communicated with our staff and then from within our staff allows them to take that information on to our front office or to the athlete themselves or to um, our manager and coaching staff um, and I think yeah one of the big things one of the big challenges on the data side is obviously coming up with ways to be creative and uh, reflecting that information and representing that information in easy to understand and engaging ways. Bill how do you uh manage the different backgrounds and make sure everyone's on the same page through communication. All right, so uh, I think, you know, part of our, our return to performance framework is is a big part of, of our communication plan. And the way that we approach that is systematically through that plan, we have common language that we all use, um, as well as we define kind of using a racy matrix matrix of responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed, uh, those levels of responsibility throughout the rehab process. Uh, we form a very um, cohesive rehab management team that we refer to uh, that really drives the process all the way through, that gives us a small, tight-knit group and 
and kind of like everybody else has, has uh, indicated prior uh, to me in this answer is that you know we everyone has an equal voice on that platform so that everybody feels empowered to participate. Uh, I think the the other thing that we do that I mentioned is really provide that rehab plan to our athlete so that they can follow along and that they understand what we're talking about and what we're looking at along the way. Um, finally, I think one of the big changes we made this year after, again, probably another flub, um, was uh, making sure that um, when our athletes test out criteria, that we have an opportunity as a rehab management team to have a discussion around those results, what it means and how we're going to act on those prior to uh, giving the athlete the results. We used to kind of do the test, give the athlete the results, and literally before you finish, they were halfway out the door on the way to the mountain. Um, and so it didn't give uh, the rest of the RMT time to uh, make a plan and respond to those that change of status. And so I think that's been a really big part for us. Um, every single one of our presentations mentioned the uh, mental and psychosocial component of rehab. Uh, could you elaborate more on how you uh, touch on this at Ski and Snowboard, but more so than how our practitioners at different levels through collegiate or high school systems can uh, touch on that component of rehab? Um, that's that's a that's a big question. I think that that probably some of our sports psychologists could provide days of education along the lines of, um, you know, I think what what we've really tried hard to do is is incorporate those four concepts of of um, that I touched on in the presentation, connectedness, um, and then some autonomy on their part and relatedness to their sport. Um, you know, so that they, the athlete really feels ownership over the process. And I don't think any of those things are hard to do. It just takes time and thought. Um, I know that uh, both Les Podlog, um, his work that he publishes out of the University of Utah, um, and all of the, the folks at, at uh, Sports Psych in uh, at the USOPC really kind of uh, bring that into their work. I think it's readily available out there. And again, I, do, I don't think it's, in, in, it's difficult to incorporate. I think making sure that you include your athletes in your training, uh, in your rehabilitation plans, making sure that they have choices. I think that was one of the big things that I really learned working with those guys is on a daily basis saying, okay, so we have to achieve some work for your quads today. Uh, here's, you know, here's six different exercises. What do you want to do? What's the what's the thing that that you think is going to get you closest to your session goal today? And allowing them to make those decisions there really uh, really helps along that line. And those are pretty simple things to implement. Yeah, fantastic. And that really ties into the, our final question that we'll throw uh, to Trent now is when and how do you include your NBA athletes? in your rehabilitation process and planning? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the short answer is day one. Uh, you know, day one, they're doing something. We're having conversations of the importance of, of staying active. Uh, and so it starts immediately. And, and along with that, I think it's important to outline the plan for them. And so showing them these are, these are the steps along the way. These are the things that you need to achieve prior to going back to practice or to a game play. Uh, and so including them early on, not only in the conversations, uh, but then also as, as much team participation as possible. So if a player is wearing a boot that they can walk, like put them in a line and have them pass to their teammates if they're doing spot shooting. Something that we may look at and say, oh, it's no big deal. But for the that particular athlete, that's critical uh, from their standpoint to be on the court with their teammates participating. So. Uh, so to summarize, you know, day one, we're including them. Uh, you know, we're trying to get them back on the court as much as possible because at the end of the day, that's where they want to be. Fantastic. So that'll wrap up our panel and we'll throw back to Charlie. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulty and we're looking forward to the next session. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, panel. Outstanding. So we are going to go into break. A couple quick shout outs, though, to Lisa Malone and Jeff Lewis. Thank you for joining us today. Um, also, in the break, we want to recognize, uh, obviously, private donations and sponsors are critical to what we and SPRI do. 
So we just want to recognize bold performance and conduct for their support of the Injury Prevention Symposium. Thank you, bold performance, and thank you, conduct. We have uh, 13 minutes for the break, so we will revisit and see you in 13 minutes. Thank you.